Hey guys, it's Kevin again. This is my review for Agent Carter Season 1, Episode 2, Bridge and Tunnel. And I was definitely looking forward to this episode because, you know, of how good the first episode was. I thought the first episode was a great way to start the show. It was honestly, it's definitely the most surprising show of the year so far. I was very pleasantly surprised by it. I really loved the direction they were going. And I really loved, um, you know, what was, you know, looking forward to the second episode. And I gotta say, second episode... Another solid episode. Loved it just as much. I honestly, I can't compare the two. This one had a lot more action, things like that. But it also was very funny as well, which I definitely really enjoyed. And it really shows how fun of a show this really is, which I definitely really like. Because Ains of S.H.I.E.L.D., while it is a very good show, it's not really a fun show. And I think that's really what's working for Agent Carter is that it really is just a fun show. And I definitely really enjoyed that. Especially all the series stuff that Marvel's been putting out. By the way, they did show the Ant-Man trailer after this, and I'm just going to quickly talk about it. I think it looks really good. Um, I think it's a very ambitious project for Marvel. I really hope it turns out well for them, and I am looking forward to it. But let's get to uh, this episode, and um, basically we start off in this broadcast of the radio show based on Captain America. And I thought this was cool to see because... It's, I mean, one of the things I, I did not like about the first Avenger was the propaganda with Captain America. And we have to remember that this cheesy promotion is still going on. It was funny to see. But, of course, Peggy is, you know, is at the diner. And she's asking Angie to turn the program off because it's just too much for her. And the two are discussing finding a new apartment for Peggy because, you know, Colleen is dead now. And Angie offers to help her get a place next to where she lives. But the sight of Colleen in the newspaper makes Peggy back off. She doesn't want the same thing that happened to Colleen happen to Angie. She doesn't want that to happen to her. So Peggy goes to Howard's house. House. <laughs> Peggy goes to Howard's house. Sorry. Um, got tongue-tied there. Um, Jarvis says that Howard insists that Peggy stay there, but she's nervous about someone finding out. So after laying on the bed, Peggy decides to stay for at least a night, and they discuss leave -a But neither has been able to come up with anything, and Peggy finds a closet of women's clothing in Howard's bedroom. And the leave -a agent is seeking instruction from his typewriter communication device, and the message says that leave -a is growing impatient. And Jarvis argues with Peggy about coming along for her mission, but Peggy tricks him out of the room, and the typewriter typewriter, um, you know, that weird guy that was on that typewriter that said that he wanted to kill, uh, Peggy, the typewriter then sends the agent to find a man named Leet Brannis and the Nitro Mine buyer. He interrogates Simon and gets the name Gino De Lucia. He then kills the man. So, Peggy, of course, and I really love seeing this, this is one of my favorite parts of the show by far, is Peggy's disguises. I think it's very fun to watch, and once again, she has another disguise in the episode. Only in this episode, she is a health inspector, and basically to search a dairy distributor for the milk truck that had the nitro um, min in it. So, she uses the vital ray tracker, but finds nothing. She questions her distributor and gets the name of a driver who has been out sick for a couple of days, Sheldon McPhee, and the SSR agents examine what's left of the refinery when the Nitro Man grenade went off. And at the office, Peggy asks Agent Sousa to cover for her, but then overhears that they have a picture of whoever killed Spider Raymond. And... He's pulled away to help investigate the rocks and debris before he can look, and Peggy is told to come work on some transport reports, and she calls Jarvis and tells him to dispose of Howard's car before the SSR can track it down. Because remember, this is an undercover mission for her. If they find out that she is working on this, she could end up getting fired. So, it's really bad for her, honestly, what she's doing. I understand why she's doing it, but at the same time, it's not good um, for her. It really is. It's not good for her at all what she's doing. Um, it definitely is going to affect her, and I like that the show is showing that. Um, I, I definitely think it's very cool that we have this plot going on. Definitely is a lot more interesting than to S.H.I.E.L.D., in my opinion. So, the SSR, um, basically are questioning the head of Roxanne at the company's office. He says he and Howard used to be friends until Howard slept with Roxanne's wife, and he says that Howard also tried to buy the refinery, and Roxanne refused, and he says he has sources at Stark Industries who have heard of the molecular nitramine, and that in it has roots in Vita radiation. So, Peggy tries using a hidden skeleton key to get the photos out of a locked drawer in Sosa's desk, 
but the phone keeps ringing, and Susu returns to his desk to answer. He hands the phone over um, to Peggy and saying it's Chief Dooley. He asks about the Vita radiation tracker, and Peggy brings the device to the Roxton office. They conscript the, uh, the conscriptor to use the device to check Roxton employees for radiation. She heads to a restroom to check herself first and finds her, which is which, and finds her watch, which is heavily eradicated, and she throws it in the trash. You know, it's it's destroyed pretty much. So the Roxton employees are lined up for a screening. She says the man named Van Ertz, the same man she blinded with a flash of the refinery. He shows clear first screen, but when Peggy suggests screening their old clothes for radiation, he bolts, and the two male SSR agents give chance, but Peggy simply cuts him off and trips him up. So Van Ert is brought into an interrogation room where Chief puts a carrot and stick in front of him, offering a chance to make a deal for information, and Van Ert refuses to give up a name. So Dooley leaves and takes the carrot with him, and Thompson puts the stick in Van Ert's mouth and starts beating him, and Dooley sends Carter home so that she doesn't have to watch. So, Andy calls Peggy into the diner to ask her about the apartment again, but Peggy continues to refuse, and Andy's starting to take it personally. You know, she's kind of wondering, you know, what really is going on here? You know, she doesn't know about the whole Colleen thing and everything, so, and she doesn't know about Peggy's secret life either, so... She definitely feels that she's doing something wrong, and I thought this was definitely a very good scene. I honestly really made me care for Andy's character more. So, Jarvis arrives in the car, Andy sees him leave, she kind of is upset about it, and once again, we see another Captain America radio show, I gotta say, those are probably the funniest scenes of the episode, these Captain America radio shows, but once again, Peggy turns it off, and Jarvis says he dropped a car in Hoboken, and they head to Cedar Grove. So, Thompson gets the name Lee Brannis, but they can't find the name anywhere, and Sousa finds the name of the milk truck driver, and they head out to find him, but the Levathon agent has already gotten the name, and his heading there, and Peggy arrives at McPhee's place and sends Jarvis home. She finds a milk truck with the nitromine grenades inside, and McPhee is listening to the radio show, and uh, Peggy takes him down, cuffs him to a chair, but here's the Levathon agent from the refinery trying to take it off with the truck. He can't get it to start because Jarvis sabotaged the motor, and Peggy interrogates the agent, who is Lee Brannis, but he says he doesn't work for Levathon anymore. And he demands protection before saying anything else, and basically, he's gotten off scot-free, pretty much. So, they leave in the milk truck, because, you know, he said that nothing bad happened. So, they leave in the milk truck, but the other Levathon agent drops down on top of it. And Julian Thompson find McPhee, still attached to chair, running down his road, running down the road, and Peggy and the agent fight on top of the truck. A bullet pierces the roof, hits Brannis. Julian Thompson question McPhee, but he's slow to talk, and Jarvis grabs Brannis, and they and Carter, I mean, they and Peggy jump from the truck. It goes off the road over a cliff, and the nitromine grenades inside implode. Brannis is badly hurt from the bullet and the jump. As he lays dying, Peggy begs for information. No, she just wants to get information out of him. He scrawls, uh, you know, he scrawls a, sam um, a symbol in the sand. It looks like a heart with a waving line crossing it horizontally, and Brannis does die, and Peggy wipes the symbol from the sand, and she and Jarvis take off. So, the SSR agents arrive on the scene. They survey the damage, and the chief notices woman's footprints around Brannis' body. So, Sousa finds a key to Helltel Cosmo um, Cosmopolitan, um, and basically... That was very interesting. So Jarvis patches up Peggy. Peggy is stubborn about admitting that she needs Jarvis's help, and Jarvis tries to talk some sense into her, reminding her that the people in her line of work need support. And she says that Steve Rogers was able to stand on his own, and Jarvis says that from what Howard Stark has told him, Captain America leaned heavily on her for support, and that's true. They really were their own team, and I think Peggy is just suffering from this loss and everything, that really she can't do anything else. She can't really do anything by herself and she needs someone to depend on her because she depended on um, Steve so much and she thinks she can do this by herself, but she really can't. You know, you can definitely tell she's grieving and I definitely see Jarvis working with Peggy, but once again, I really feel this is all about forming S.H.I.E.L.D. That's really what I think he's going to talk to her about. So... Peggy goes to the apartment with Andy, you know, she does decide to go to it, but it's an all-female complex, it requires her to interview the woman who runs the Griffith Hotel. The complex is very strict about observing prosper code of conduct for, one, for young women. 
and um, Peggy arrives at the SSR office and finds Thompson, Sousa, and Julie looking over some photos, and it turns out they're actually selling a bet about whether or not Joe DiMaggio is in the hotel, and it turns out they only got photos of Peggy from her backside, so they have no idea what's going on, and the very end of the episode, the radio show is playing again, the SSR continues to pull apart the ball refinery debris, they find the bumper and license plate to Howard Stark's car, and now they're going to go after Howard Stark. And this could end up being terrible for Peggy because Peggy could have her cover blown. And I think that this show is just amazing. Now, I have to say this episode, if I had to choose, I definitely would say the first episode. But I still love this episode. Still a 5 out of 5. Still a perfect episode. Still nothing wrong with it. A lot of things I definitely want to talk about. I definitely see Jarvis and Peggy working together. I think it's inevitable now that they are going to work together. I mean, you can just tell that he that he's there. He's going to be there for her and he really wants to... He really does care for her, and he wants to be there for her, so I definitely see the two of them teaming up. Now, if the SSR finds out, um, I don't think the SSR is going to find out yet about Peggy spying. I, I feel like they're gradually going to find clues out about it, because I don't want them to find out. This is a spy show, and a good spy show, you don't find out, you know, they don't find out the truth till later. So, I definitely want to see what's going to happen here. Definitely, it's not going to end well for Peggy, I'm going to say that. It's not going to end well for her. Uh, Sousa and Peggy... I still see the chemistry between them. I definitely still see a lot of chemistry um, between what's going on there. Is Peggy actually going to be able to help Howard Stark? Honestly, at this point, I don't know if she's going to be able to because it seems like she has so much else going on. You know, the SSR wants her to do things. I don't know if she's going to be able to juggle it all at once, and I think this episode portrayed that very well. Also, is Peggy going to admit her real job to Angie? I don't know. But I definitely want to talk about the show because this was, you know, the, the second of the two episodes that premiered back-to-back, -back, and I got to say, this show overall, I love. I think both episodes, I it took me a very short amount of time, but I already love this show. I think the show is amazing. And I honestly, as I said, I really feel this is going to be the show that when we look back at Marvel, I mean, knowing all the Marvel shows are coming out soon on Netflix, like Daredevil, um, they released the poster for that today, and they released the, um, the date for that, and... I think Agent Carter is going to be that show that proves, yeah, Marvel can make a good TV show when they try. And as I said, I think the problem with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is just that it was an ensemble show, and this is not. This is definitely a much more focused show. You got a great female lead. It's really good to see a female lead. It really is working perfectly, and I, I think it, it really is working very well, definitely. I think, um, you know, I, I really like what they're doing with it. I, I think it's really cool that they are... Um, focusing on Peggy Carter, her character, you know, is very interesting. I love seeing her again. I love seeing her not wanting to, you know, let people push her around. And, you know, there's this very sad scene with Sousa where he's trying to defend her, but then he has to not defend her, and she says, don't defend me and everything. It was, it was kind of a sad scene because you know he does care about her, but I thought that was a very well done scene. I definitely really enjoyed that. But overall, guys, that's basically from where I review the second episode. Let me know what you guys saw this episode. Overall, guys, I thought this episode was just as good as the first one. I still really love it. Um, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Now, let me tell you guys something. My next few videos um, are, actually, are actually going to be um, for something interesting. Because a bunch of movies that I want to see that are for Golden Globes and for the Oscars and are probably potential Oscar contenders um, just got leaked online to Solar Movie. Um, and when I say a bunch of them got leaked online, a bunch of them got leaked online in, like, DVD format. So I am definitely gonna watch those. I'm definitely gonna have a review for one of those movies up today. I, I think I know which one I'm doing. I'm gonna probably do the shortest one today because I don't want to do a really long one today. And I will see you guys for that, um, video. I, I will see you guys for that. Um, but look forward to that, definitely. And I'll see you guys in my next video, which will be for a movie review of one of those movies I just mentioned. So I'll see you guys for that. Also, let me know what you think of Agent Carter. What do you think of the Ant-Man trailer? I'm looking forward to seeing how that's going to be. It looks like it's going to be a really fun movie. And the show also, Agent Carter, is a very fun show. And I really like that. But it also does handle emotion very well. Very much like The Flash. How The Flash handles emotion very well. But overall, it is a fun show. And I definitely think it's really good. But I will see you guys in my next video, which will be for one of those movie reviews. So I'll see you guys for that. Okay, bye.